I want to uh, also say it's a special Sunday. We've been doing Connections new members uh, classes for uh, the last uh, several weeks here for about four weeks. And uh, meeting, it's been wonderful to be able to just meet and share about our church uh, with people, and this morning in the service, at the end of the service, we're going to be bringing new members into the church today. This is a red letter day for your pastor. I love whenever we have the opportunity to do this, and so uh, it's been great to be able to connect. And most of the people that have been in the group with us have um, are able to be here today. We uh, do have uh, some that that aren't here, uh, one or two that are sick this morning that aren't here, um, but. Uh, I want to mention for those of you that maybe had missed a class or two, or maybe you were able to come to some but weren't able to come to all, um, then you can still come this morning at the close of the service and join the church, and there'll be opportunity for you to, to pick back up on the next class to, if you missed out on a class or an opportunity to be able to join in with us then, but that doesn't mean that you can't uh, come and join this morning. Uh, we, have a, we have a church that welcomes. Somebody say amen. amen. We're a welcoming church, and we're glad to have you here. This morning, have a couple things. Vicki Allen uh, has a testimony uh, of the Lord and what he has done in her life. And I'm going to ask her to come, and she's going to just share that with us. Will you welcome her as she comes to share with us this morning? God bless you. This morning... I would like to share with you God's unending love, his amazing grace, and his, just his all-out goodness for a sinner like me. Um, I have this nice little story. It's going to take me a little bit to tell. Pastor, I promise I'm not doing that to you this morning. I'm just going to... Um, Cut to the chase, because that's the most important part, correct? And then, if it's okay with you, I would like to share a little bit about what happened to me last week. Okay, so as of yesterday, God has blessed me with 11 years of freedom from my addictions. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Um, and if he did it for me, he can do it for anybody. Amen. That's right. So, but um, last week, as some of you know, I was in the hospital. And normally, my blood pressure runs astronomically high, like maybe 235 over 118 or something stupid. <laughs> and I went in the hospital, and it dropped to 66 over 44. And they thought I was dying. They was ready to rush me to ICU. And I said, it's not happening. So right before they came, the sun was shining in my window. And I knew it wasn't the sun. I knew it was the sun. And I just knew right then and there, everything was going to be OK. So they came in, took my blood pressure. Everything was fine. <laughs> so while I was there, you too. I'm Alex. So, but while I was there, I did have the blessings and the pleasure to share God and His love with several of the nurses. I got to play worship music and watch the cleaning ladies dance around, all happy. And I got to pray over a couple of the patients. And. Let me tell you, it's your worst. Even from a hospital bed, you can still serve God. <laughs> Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Amen. All right. I want to uh, also say it's a special Sunday. We've been doing Connections new members uh, classes for uh, the last uh, several weeks here for about four weeks. And uh, meeting, it's been wonderful to be able to just meet and share about our church 
uh, with people. And this morning in the service, at the end of the service, we're going to be bringing new members into the church today. This is a red letter day for your pastor. I love whenever we have the opportunity to do this. And so uh, it's been great to be able to connect. And most of the people that have been in the group with us have, um, are able to be here today. We uh, do have uh, some that, that aren't here, uh, one or two that are sick this morning that aren't here. Um, but I uh, want to mention for those of you that maybe had missed a class or two, or maybe you were able to come to some but weren't able to come to all, um, then you can still come this morning at the close of the service and join the church. And there'll be opportunity for you to, to pick back up on the next class to, if you missed out on a class or an opportunity to be able to join in with us then. But that doesn't mean that you can't uh, come and join this morning. Hallelujah. Now, I know this morning um, it is Christmas season and I uh, appreciate uh, as I share with you last week, I told Jessica, I just kind of spontaneously last week in talking about Deck the Halls, I said, uh, you know, Jessica's had a vision of making a winter wonderland here, and we're going to try and make it very beautiful. And then afterwards, she said, boy, you put the pressure on me. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, didn't they all just, everybody do a wonderful job? So I know it's the Christmas season. We're decorated for Christmas. Um, and uh, starting next week, I'm going to share with you a couple of messages that have to do with Christmas. But this morning uh, is a special day. And I'm going to finish up today the series that uh, I've been sharing with you called Gates of Your Deliverance. Gates of Your Deliverance. I believe that if you're bound, he wants you set free. And as, as Vicki testified this morning, the anniversary of the Lord setting her free. He's a God that sets you free from addiction. He's a God that will set you free from bondage to sin. All the things that the enemy wants in our lives of ways of thinking that he renews our mind, causes us to be new. He is a God of freedom. He's not a God that causes us to be in bondage, but he says that he that the Son sets free... It's free indeed, unquestionably free. Somebody say amen. amen. So we've been talking um, and reading out of the book of Acts chapter 12. And if you have your Bibles, would you go to Acts chapter 12 with me? Um, or on your phone or your iPad, go to Acts chapter 12. I'm going to share with you uh, here, starting in verse 4. Herod has arrested James. James, the disciple, the brother of John, and he killed James. When he killed him, he murdered him, it really caused the Jews to be happy. And he thought, man, if, that, if they like that, then I'm going to keep up doing that. So then in verse 4, when he had arrested him, talking about Peter now, he went and got Peter, he put him in prison. And he delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. So Peter is now next on his list. He just killed James, and now he's going to kill Peter. And so in verse 5, Acts chapter 12, verse 5 says, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer. Somebody say constant prayer. Constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Sometimes you pray and God just does it. And sometimes you have to just keep on pressing in and have constant prayer. I've heard people say, well, once you pray once, you shouldn't pray about it again. I don't think that that's biblical at all. I don't see that in the word of God. Constant prayer. We need to be continual in prayer. We need to keep on seeking the face of God. If we ever prayed, we ought to be praying today. The lights are dim, but you can still say amen. Nobody be scared. <laughs> Verse 6 says, And when Herod was about to bring him out. And when that says bring him out, it means was about to end his life. He was getting ready to kill him. That night, in the morning, Herod's planning on killing him. But that night, Peter was sleeping. Bound with two chains between two soldiers. And the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now, I preached on that several weeks ago and how you can have peace in the middle of circumstances and trials when you have a calling of God on your life. 
Then in verse 7, Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison. And that did not wake Peter up. The angel came, the light shone, Peter snored on. And so the angel struck Peter on the side, and he raised him up, and he said, Arise quickly. And when he did, his chains fell off. He had been bound, but God sent an angel to come to bring deliverance. The light shined, the angel came. He said, hey buddy, he kicked him and said, get up. He got up and his chains immediately fell off. And verse eight, then the angel said to him, gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, put on your garment and follow me. Verse nine, so he went out and he followed him. And he did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but he thought he was seeing a vision. Peter thought, man, this is a great dream I am having. Almost, you ever have a dream that seems so real, you think it's real? Peter thought, man. And then when you wake up, you think, oh, it wasn't real. Peter had the exact opposite. He had something really happening, and he thought, man, this is a great dream. Verse 10, and when they were past the first and the second guard post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord, and they went out and they went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. Verse 11, and when Peter had come to himself, he said, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel He's delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. Now, that's where we left off. We've talked about three different gates. So we talked about those first two gates he talks about. The first is the inner gate. The inner gate. All of us have that. We have things inside us. Let me tell you, you need to get free in here first. Right? Right? Maybe it's sin that's in your life that God wants to set you free from. Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's insecurity. Maybe it's your past. Maybe it's hurt and pain that you've carried with you. Maybe it's unforgiveness. And having that stuff inside us, we will never get to where God's calling us if we don't get free inside first. Amen? And then we talked about the second gate, and he... Peter defined what that was, the expectations of people. You get these voices of other people, and you hear them. And sometimes we hear voices, and they're not even real. I'm not talking about people that maybe have a little bit of issues up here. But the enemy will say, you know what, they're all talking about you. You know, everybody's against you. You know what they all think. You know, everybody at the church knows this and that, and everybody's talking about this because he's trying to isolate you. We talked about that last week and how insidious the enemy is because when you deal with the first gate, the enemy comes to you and it actually sounds like your own voice inside your head and he tries to plant these thoughts. But when you get to the second gate, then he tries to use the voices of other people against you. But God can set free from the inner gate. God can set you free from the expectations of people that you're living for an audience of one. Somebody say amen. And when you get past the first gate and past the second gate, then you get to that third gate we talked about last week. That's the city gate. When they got to the city gate... This huge gate, this iron gate that the Bible describes here, the gate that would be the defense against an invading army. This was a, a secured gate that couldn't be, you could not easily get through. That gate opened of its own accord. That was absolutely impossible. But when Peter got free in the inner gate... And he got free from the expectations of people. 
Then he was called by God to go into the city. And let me tell you, if you'll get really radically free, the devil cannot stop you from the calling of God that God has on your life. God has an assignment over you. It's an assignment in this city, in this region, in this area, in this nation, and to around the world that God has called us. We just have to be, Lord, set me free, and I'm going to run after your anointing. Amen? But there's still one more gate that Peter had to get through. I want to talk about it this morning. Look on to the next verse in Acts chapter 12, verse 12. Here's what he said. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where they were gathered together praying. Peter went to the prayer meeting. He shows up at the prayer meeting where they're praying for him. Are you catching this? They're all gathered. They're praying constantly in prayer. God, deliver Peter. God, we're praying for deliverance in Jesus' name. And Peter shows up. Verse 13, And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate... A girl named Rhoda came to answer. Verse 14. When she recognized Peter's voice because of her gladness, she did not open the gate. (laughs) But ran back in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. Everybody's in there praying, God deliver Peter. Only one person hears the knock and she runs out and she sees Peter and gets so excited, comes back in and says, hey, Peter's here. Verse 15, but they said to her, you're beside yourself. (laughs) Yet she kept insisting that it was. So they said, it's his angel. Now Jews believed that there was a guardian angel that was specifically assigned to each person. And so we're not completely sure what they were thinking here. But maybe they're thinking that the guardian angel came to deliver some sort of a message. So he took the form of Peter and looked like Peter and sounded like Peter. We're not sure exactly what they're thinking at this point. And verse 16, but now Peter continued knocking when they opened the door. I'll insert the word finally. When they finally opened the door and they saw him, they were astonished. So we've talked about the first three gates. Today, I want to talk to you about the fourth gate. And the fourth gate is the church. So you get free inside. You get free from the expectations of people outside. God wants to use you in the city, but then there is a gate here called the church. Now let me just say, I love the church. I have such a heart for the church. I hear people today, I hear ministers preach about the church, and sometimes I think they don't respect the church. I hear Christians talk about the church, and I think... Jesus wouldn't talk about the church that way. Jesus doesn't want us to talk about the church any more than if you are married, then you would want people talking about your spouse. He is married to the church. He loves the church. Somebody say amen right there. Now listen, I don't want anybody talking about anybody, but you talk about me, that's one thing, but don't talk about my wife. I don't think Jesus wants people ripping the church up. I love the church. I'm so glad God's presence comes down when the church comes together. I love to be able to gather. You know, it gives us strength in the body of Christ when we come together. The church is united and the church is one in him, in Christ. Somebody say amen. We have that incredible opportunity. I love to be part of the church. But... Here's the deal. The church is not perfect. And sometimes there can be issues in the church. Now let me me say, we do have a requirement. This morning we're going to bring in members. We have a requirement 
to be a member of our church. To be a member of our church, you cannot be perfect. No perfect people need apply. We don't have any of them. We've never had any perfect people. All of us are flawed. All of us have a past. All of us have dealt with stuff. All of us have things. And we come to Jesus and say, Jesus, would you forgive me of my sin? And would you help me to be more like you? We are all striving one day after the next to, to live up to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And being in the body is what causes us to be able to do that. We're just imperfect people serving an absolutely perfect God. Amen? But note the church. This church is fervently in prayer. They are in constant prayer. But they were praying with a locked door. They were praying behind a locked door. There was an obstacle in the way. Everybody there was praying. Everybody there wanted a miracle. Everybody there wanted God to move. But they themselves had an obstacle that was preventing the miracle from getting in. They didn't probably think about it that way. I mean, nobody could really blame them for having the door be locked. Herod was threatening. Herod had just killed James and was getting ready to kill Peter. And they thought, we don't know who's going to be next. Who is he going to target next? Maybe he's going to send his soldiers and arrest all of us. Right? So you think, well, it would be reasonable for them to have a locked door. But sometimes we don't make a whole lot of sense. Sometimes we willingly allow obstacles in our lives that defeat the things that we say we're in faith and praying for. Now, they had a locked door, and you could say they were locking the door to keep Herod's soldiers out, but just think about it. That door provided no security against Herod. That door provided no security against his soldiers. If his soldiers wanted to come and take them, their hope was not in what they were doing in the natural. God alone was protecting them. Herod couldn't bring anything into their lives that didn't go through God first. And let me just tell you this morning, child of God, the devil can't bring anything into your life that doesn't go through your God first. But sometimes we can put up obstacles and we can have all the reasons in the world why we have an obstacle. Sometimes we have an obstacle because, you know, I've been so hurt and so I just build this little wall right over here. And we don't realize that we are embracing something that is prohibiting the miracle from walking into our midst. It's stopping God from doing that that he desires to do in our lives. Are you hearing that this morning? Sometimes we embrace the obstacle while we're praying for the miracle. The obstacle might be doubt. Sometimes you know what the obstacle is? It's our words. We're praying one thing and we're speaking something else. I know that's nobody in this room. We're praying, God, would you do a miracle? But then we're, we're sowing with our mouth the opposite. Sometimes it's walking in disobedience to the Lord in an area of our lives and thinking, well, that area doesn't affect this. I'm praying about this, but we have disobedience over here. And that disobedience is an obstacle. Sometimes it's fear and having fear be your motivator. Fear be the thing that causes you to make certain decisions. Sometimes it's negative thinking. Sometimes we have allowed our minds to get clouded with the stuff of the world. And we're thinking worldly thoughts rather than having our thoughts focused on the Lord. 
Sometimes it's sin that we are tolerating in our lives. And you allow sin. You think, well, that's not a big deal. It's just a little thing. And, you know, God knows and God understands and nobody's perfect, so it's okay. Don't tolerate sin in your life. Don't tolerate sin in your words, in your thoughts, in your actions. Don't allow it in your life. Sometimes that obstacle can be our tradition in the church. Sometimes we're just doing what the church, but this is how we always did it. And if God wants to move, God can move within the parameters that we've set. The greatest obstacle that you have, only you know, but I want you to think about it right now. If I would just ask you, what's the greatest obstacle to the miracles God wants to do in your life? Think about it. What's the obstacle that maybe you've embraced? What's the obstacle that maybe that you have, you have allowed to prevent God from doing everything that he wants to do? They were praying for a miracle, but their actions showed they didn't even believe the miracle was going to happen. Now, I don't want to ask you to raise your hands. It's dark, so I wouldn't even know if you're raising your hand or not. But how many times have we prayed for things and we really didn't think God was going to do them? I've prayed for things before, and when God did them, I went, wow. Because I really wasn't believing God like I should. Now, we can have a religious attitude about praying while still not having faith on the prayer. They're praying, God set Peter free, and they're locking Peter out at the same time. Thank God for the prayers that he's answered that we really didn't believe he was going to answer. But I, now, when I was sick, I was... Very sick. And the doctors told me, there's no cure. You will never be cured of this. You'll have this the rest of your life. And they're walking through all the treatments and medications and all the stuff that I'm going to have to do and all the infusions. And I'm going to have to be in the cancer center every month the rest of your life getting these infusions and doing all this stuff. They had it all lined out for me. And after, there were so many people that prayed. After I was healed... I had people come to me and go, Pastor, I knew God was going to heal you. I knew. I was, I was believing, and in prayer, God already told me he was going to heal you. I love it when God says that. I had other people that came and said, I am so happy you got healed. But they, they, they said, I just, I, I didn't think it was going to happen. You know, the doctor said it was impossible. And then I had people who came who were in such disbelief who said, do you think you're really healed though? Do you think that maybe it's just in your head? And maybe you want to be healed so much that you think you're doing better? And I said, listen, if, I was, if I, my brain was that powerful, I would have done that a whole long time ago. I did not spend all that time laying up in Cleveland Clinic in the ICU and had oxygen and have them doing all these treatments. I wouldn't have, if my brain could have just said, hey, fix this. <laughs> Y'all know me pretty well. You know, my brain ain't that good. Sometimes I, I have to have somebody remind me what my name is. What, what day of the week is this? What did I have for lunch yesterday? I don't even know what I've made myself coming and going. My brain's not that smart. But we try to find every reason possible to discount God doing the miraculous. We can sometimes put every obstacle in the way. And then even when we're faced with a thing, really? Are you sure? Maybe it's going to come back. Maybe you're just feeling better today. Let me tell you, God is a miracle working God. God's a delivering God. God's a God who does what can't be done any other way.
if God answered the prayers that we really didn't even have faith believing him for, how much more will he answer the prayers of a church who begins to stretch their faith out and remove every obstacle and say, God, just do it. Just do the impossible. God, just show up and let there just be miracles and miracles and miracles. God, come and be who you said that you would be in your word. God, we're anticipating it. We're expecting it. Here's what the word says in Luke chapter 1, verse 37. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Nothing will be impossible. In Matthew 17, 20, Jesus said, For assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. Luke chapter 18, verse 27, but he said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Mark chapter 10 verse 27, but Jesus looked at them and he said, with men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all, all, all things are possible. We just have to remove the obstacles Do you notice Peter is in the prison in chains and chains fall off. He's got soldiers held in an inner prison and the door just swings wide open. They walk through the next ward or the next level of the prison and the door opens. They walk out and when they get out, there's the gate to the city and all of a sudden the gate to the city opens automatically. Every gate open, open, open. The hardest gate for Peter to get through was the church. Let it sink in. God's hand is not short. God is not up in heaven wringing his hands wondering what he's going to do about your situation. God's not worried. God's not sitting there going, man, I just don't know how I could fix this situation right here. But when Peter got to the church, the church could not believe it. I looked it up in different translations. When she comes in and she tells them Peter's there, in the King James it says, Thou art mad. <laughs> Sounds very proper, doesn't it? Thou weren't mad. In the New King James it says, You are beside yourself. In the New Living Translation it says, You're out of your mind. In Webster's Bible translation, it says, Thou art insane. <laughs> In the Holdman Christian Standard Bible, it says, very simply put, You're crazy. <laughs> the church hears that God is doing the exact thing that they've been praying for. And they say, no, it can't be. You're crazy. No way. You're beside yourself. No, you're just imagining it. No, you're just thinking that. No, you're beside. You are mad. Thou art mad. They couldn't even comprehend that God would do what they asked him to do. If I'm praying, but I don't believe it, why am I even praying in the first place? They were praying for Peter to be delivered, but they were still locked up. 
Think of it for a moment. Peter wasn't locked up. Peter was the one that was saying, God set him free so he won't be locked up anymore. Peter was free and the church was locked up. Let me tell you, that, that sounds humorous. But sometimes the church is praying for freedom for others and we are not walking in that freedom ourselves. Sometimes the church, we're praying, God save them over there. God deliver them over there. Let me tell you, God wants to do an incredible deliverance ministry in this church. We've seen God set a whole lot of people free. But unless we're free, I said, unless we are free, how are we going to see God bring freedom to others? If the church is locked up, the devil loves a church who's locked up because you're praying behind a locked door. You are praying, saying, oh, God, move out there, but you're allowing stuff in your own life to keep you bound. He wants to set you radically free. He wants to do such a work of deliverance in the church that it can't be held in the church anymore that it flows out of this place that everywhere we go deliverance comes healing comes that freedom is declared throughout this entire region God doesn't just want to set you free so you can be free. God wants to set you free so you can proclaim freedom to those who are captive. Every other gate opened automatically. But when Peter got to the church, the miracle had to stand at the door and knock. He didn't have to knock at any other gate. But the church was not open and receptive. I want you to let this sink in for a moment. Because God's speaking to us today. God's speaking to us today. Peter's knocking. And the church is going about its business. And Peter's knocking. And the church is taking a vote about what they're going to do. And Peter's still knocking. And the church is inside, and they're arguing about what color the carpet should be. And Peter's still knocking. And the church is in there, and somebody's saying, I think we should sing modern worship songs. And somebody else saying, I think we should sing hymns. And the miracle is still knocking at the door. The church is inside and they're debating the theological implications of if God still does miracles and if God will still heal and if God will still... And the miracle is knocking at the door of the church. The miracle saying, I'm here. The church is inside praying saying, God, will you send a miracle? And God saying, open the door. Open the door. The miracle is there. There are miracles knocking at the door of this church. There are miracles knocking at your door. We just have to be willing to say, God, I don't, I don't want anything holding me back. See, the church gets too easily distracted with just doing stuff. We do a lot of stuff. I mean, we have to do some stuff. We have to do, but we start majoring on the minors. You know what? I, I want this to be a miracle church. Now we've seen, I, don't, I, I couldn't even list the amount of miracles we've seen. We have seen the Lord do so many miracles. Many of you that are sitting here, you're, you're miracles. You're, just, you're, you're a miracle. But I'm telling you, I want us to be such a miracle church that every time we come together, we anticipate, oh, there's going to be miracles. There's going to be miracles today? Yeah, there's going to be a miracle today. Yeah. Miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. I just want God to just, 
I want there to be not one obstacle. I want us to not only have miracles, I want miracles to be anticipated and to be expected and to be invited into this place. I want miracles to flow in this house. Are you hearing me? Everybody with me on this? I want miracles. The, the greatest of all is salvation. God, give us souls. God, give us souls. God, give us a harvest. Lord, we're praying. Lord, a tithe of Conneaut, Ohio. I'm asking you for 1,300 souls to come into this church. God, over this next decade, do it. God, I'm praying for 500 praying, serving men in this church. Lord, do it. God, I pray for prodigals to come home. Sons and daughters are going to prophesy. Lord, I'm thanking you that young men are going to see visions. Old men are going to dream dreams. Lord, I'm thanking you that there's miracles of deliverance. I'm thanking you for chains falling off. I'm thanking you for heroin addicts being set free. I'm thanking you for opioid addictions to be broken in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm thanking you, Lord, for minds that have been perverted by the things of this world to be loose and set free from perversion in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, that you're still in the delivering business. God, I pray for miracles of healing over Oh God, Lord, I pray of healing, Lord, of cancer. I pray of healing, Lord, of problems in people's spine and in their, in their bones. I'm thanking you, God, that you're going to heal, Lord, of high blood pressure, Lord, that you're going to heal of diabetes. Lord, I thank you that you're going to heal, Lord, of disease, that there is no cure because with you, all things are possible. God, I'm thanking you for marriages being restored. I'm thanking you, Lord, for husbands and wives, Lord, to have a marriage where it looked like it wasn't possible to be brought back together. God, I'm thanking you for families to be restored, for children, oh God, that have went wayward to find their way back home. Lord, I'm thanking you for the impossible becoming reality right before our eyes because he's still a God of miracles. Sometimes people say, I don't know how to pray. You don't know how to pray right there. There's a good prayer list for you. I'm thanking God for miracles of sanctification. I'm thanking God for miracles of baptism in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. I'm thanking God for miracles of anointing. I'm thanking God for miracles of calling into ministry. I'm thanking God for miracles with our children, even all the way down to the nursery. God, use them mightily. Lord, use them mightily. Hallelujah. Some people say, oh, you're crazy. You're crazy. That's what they said to Rhoda. I'd rather stand with her. You know, you don't think God does miracles. You're sitting in one. You don't think God does miracles. You're listening to one. He's a miracle working God. See, we need more people like Rhoda. We need people because everybody else is praying. Everybody else in there interceding. Nobody else hears the knock at the door. You need to hear this this morning. Nobody else hears the knock at the door. But one girl, she's, she's praying with faith. We need those who hear what no one else hears. See, they were all in the same place. They were all praying the same thing. They were all in agreement and they, they all looked the part and they all had the same opportunity. But only one person heard the miracle knocking at the door. 
See, I thank God for people that hear things in the Spirit that everybody else is going around and go, what? What are you talking about? But in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit speaking to them. And they say, I, I'm hearing something. And, and, all the, and other people might go, you're crazy. No, I don't even know what you're talking about. No, but I, I can hear what thus saith the Lord. And I, I sense the moving of the Spirit. My mom used to get up at 4 a.m. She would get up and pray. She would pray for four hours. I came to her house at 8 o'clock when Brooke was just a little baby, and I would bring Brooke and drop her off over there, and she would babysit Brooke. And when I would get there at 8 in the morning, my mom had already been in intercession for four hours straight. I'm just trying to, you know, get a cup of coffee and run out the door and hopefully, you know, know what I'm doing for the day. And I would walk in, and I would be bringing Brooke in and talk to my mom. And my mom would oftentimes start to tell me, oh, I was praying this morning. And she would start to say, and I just sense the anointing of, I don't know how you pray for four hours if you don't sense the anointing of the Holy Spirit. She just prayed every day. She said, I, I sense the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And she would start to tell me what God had spoken to her. And stay, she would look at me and she, multiple times she would, she would say, Oh, I feel him right now. I feel him right now. And then she would look at me, and now I'm her son, so she could do this. She would say, do you feel him? Do you sense that anointing right now? You don't lie to your mama. <laughs> so there were times that I'm there going, I do, Mom. I do. And there were other times I had to say, Mom, I, you know, I don't feel him because I, I haven't even you know, really been in that place where you've been this morning. I'm just trying to just get my life going here this morning, and get some coffee and realize what time it is. My mom said, I, I sense the anointing of the Holy Spirit because God's been speaking to me. If we'll pray and get the doors unlocked, let me tell you, we'll hear things that other people don't hear. Other people look at Connie out of Ohio and say, oh, look at Connie out We'll look at Connie out of Ohio and go, oh, Connie out of Ohio that's where the Holy Ghost is being poured out. That's where miracles are happening. That's the place that God's using in these last days before he comes, that the, there's going to be Pentecostal revival and it'll go out from Conneaut, Ohio, all around this world. We need to have a discernment and a sensitivity to what the Holy Spirit is speaking. If we listen in the Spirit, God is speaking. Other people may not hear, but we need to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Rhoda goes to the door. She says, who is it? <laughs> Maybe she said it that way. I don't know. Maybe they had a little peephole. I don't know. And she realizes it's Peter. Peter is here. But she forgets to unlock the door and let him in. The church needs to open the door. I said the church needs to open the door. God desires to do things in this church. Your healing is at the door. Your prodigal children are at the door. The harvest is at the door. Breakthrough is at the door. <sighs> we just have to decide, I'm not going to keep there be any obstacle that I will allow to keep in my life that's going to lock out what God wants to do in me. What miracle are you believing God for today? Right now, I want you to think about it. What miracle are you believing God for today? Don't take this question frivolously. I'm asking you, and he's asking you. What miracle are you believing me for today? Now, my next question to you is, what obstacle is in the way in your life? What obstacle is there 
that's stopping that. If the Holy Spirit's dealing with you about something right now, you need to just begin. If there's sin in your life, if there's things you haven't repented of, you need to repent and ask Jesus right now at your seat, Lord Jesus, forgive me of this. If there's mindsets and attitudes that have held you back with nobody moving, nobody looking around, right now, there at your seat, I want you to just begin to be honest with the Lord. God, I don't want anything to stand between you and me. I don't want the miracle to be held at a locked door. Hallelujah. God, right now, I thank you for setting people free. I thank you for deliverance. I thank you, God, you're preparing us. Well, some of us, you know what the locked door is? It's simple prayerlessness. It's just lack of prayer. It's wonderful to pray in church on Sunday. God's calling us to be a church of prayer. Well, some of us, it's just allowing doubt, and we need to start operating in faith. We just need to start believing God. Well, some of us, it's just sloth of things that God's told us to do, and we just need to say, I'm going to prioritize what God's told me, and I'm going to do that. Hallelujah. Church, I want this to be a church of open doors. Number one, we need to open the door to the Holy Spirit. I want the Holy Ghost to have his way in this church. I want the Holy Spirit to have free reign in this body. I want the miraculous to be done. And I can't do it, but he can. And he's here. So we need to be continually open to him. Somebody say amen. amen. And then secondly... We need to be open to all those who come in. We need to be open to the lost that he desires to send here. We need to be open to those that don't look like us, talk like us, act like us, think like us, but they want to find Jesus and we can help them. Somebody say amen. This morning... This morning, we just have a great opportunity because it's an illustration of that right here. This morning, let me tell you, this is a lighthouse. This church is called to be a lighthouse to this region. And this morning, as your pastor, I get an incredible, incredible opportunity to welcome people into our fellowship. And here's what often happens. They're already a part. And let me just say, being a ledger member, it's a name on a, on a piece of paper somewhere. But it is important that we have this commitment to one another. I commit to you as your pastor. Our church, we commit together as one body. And that we make a commitment to serve the Lord here. And today is an opportunity for public commitment. And so sometimes what happens is people are already, they've been in the church for quite a while by the time they actually walk through this process. And that's, that's fine. That's wonderful. Sometimes there are people that are brand new. And man, this is just, it's exciting to me to see the church growing. And so this morning, all those of you who've been with us and, and who are taking the step of joining uh, the church, I want to ask you if you just come and stand right up here with me this morning. Everybody who... Don't be shy. Everybody who's been uh, in the class and who's joining the church, come on up and stand right up here. Now, if you haven't been in all the classes, again, you still, you just come right on up anyway. Isn't this awesome? Isn't this wonderful? Praise God. I think back to what the book of Acts said, that they kept on praying 
They kept on serving. They met daily from house to house. They worshiped the Lord. They broke bread. And the Lord added to the church. That's what he does. Amen? Amen. I'm going to ask our elders, all of our leaders, and your spouses, if you will, to come and stand right in back of all these that are here. Miss Jessica's going to help me this morning to be able to, uh, she's got, after we finish uh, praying over all these, she's got membership certificates for them uh, from us. As a congregation this morning, we get the opportunity to just love on everybody that's here. We get the opportunity to be able to extend to them. And I've let them all know that in our church, we have no seniority. So importance isn't determined by the number of years that you've been a member. Somebody say amen. 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 Right? So all of us are one in Christ. And so as they come in, they're just as much a member as if you've been here for 150 years. Yep. Right? Isn't that good? So I want you, if you will, to stand. I'm going to ask uh, the elders and leaders to just stand behind these that are here. I'm going to come through to anoint and pray over them. Jessica will come through with me. We'll pray over them. And I want you to extend your hands in this direction and let's pray over these this morning. Father, I thank you. Lord, I thank you, God indeed, for what you have done in this church and that that you are going to do. Lord, I thank you, God, for the celebration that we have this morning. It's a celebration, Lord, of of having, Lord, those that are joining into this fellowship. And Lord, we just pray your anointing as we anoint with oil. Lord, that, that symbol of the anointing of your Holy Spirit, God, upon them. Lord, in serving you and in being committed in this local body, Lord, we thank you that indeed your hand is upon them, that your anointing, Lord, is upon them. Lord, I thank you indeed for your touch in their lives. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for what you are doing in this church. God, thank you for the greater things, the greater things, Lord, that you have prophesied, that you have spoken, and God, that you will bring to pass. Father, we pray over each and every one of these, Lord. They are a part of the body of Christ that you, that you are putting together here in this church. And we thank you for them in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Now, for every one of you that are joining as members, I just want to look at you and say, I'm honored. I'm honored to have you be part of our church. You're part of us. I'm honored to be your pastor. We love you all. And we've been able to spend a little bit of time, but I hope even get to spend a whole lot more time together and to work together in ministry. As we've been talking about every member being a minister and that God's called us to serve, that that's what members do. The members commit and members serve and, and, and we have that opportunity with one another. And so... We, we just, we are excited to be able to say, you're part of us. Now, you've always been, some of you have been in the church for a while, and you've always been a part of us from the first day that you walked in the door. Come on now. But today, we just kind of formalize the relationship, so that's a good thing, right? We're here for you. We're here for you. And these brothers and sisters that are in back of you that are leaders in our church, they're here for you. And all of us as a congregation, we're here for you. And here's what I want to do this morning. I want to have the opportunity, uh, and we're gonna, we'll have the line start. Let's have the line start on this side over here, because if not, it'll get a little bit crazy. And I get to go through first. And you get to hug everybody's <laughs> neck. Here's what I want to encourage you. If there are people that are up here and you don't know them by name, you can introduce yourself. Don't expect them to remember everybody's name. Introduce yourself, but ask them their name and try to remember their name so that you get a connection with them. Is that good? Is that good? All right, so the line starts in back of the pastor, 
right over here. And I want to ask everybody in the building to come through and just let uh, these know how much that you love them and appreciate them this morning. I believe in you. I believe in you. You're the God of miracles. 